for stopping by. This is Free On Board, a podcast by Tridge. You're in the right place if you're looking to stay up to date with the latest food and agricultural news. Now, on to the updates. Today, we're discussing the fact that soybean prices in the U.S. are to remain near historic heights. This is despite higher than ever production volumes in the U.S. A similar phenomenon has also been mirrored globally. Despite high global production, prices have remained high. What kind of unprecedented demand is keeping prices so high? Theo Venter, a global market analyst, is joining us today. Hey Theo, thank you for joining us today. Uh, yeah, yeah. Thanks for having me. So you wrote two very interesting analyses on soybean production, demand and prices, with one focusing on USA production and prices and the other focusing on world production and consumption. Let's work on understanding the first one. The U.S. had a record crop in the 2021-2022 marketing year. Why are prices so high? Yeah, they had one of the best crops, well, the the best crop on record, but there were a lot of external factors pushing prices much higher. I mean, we all know about the war going on in Eastern Europe. So Russia and Ukraine are both very big sunflower producers and sunflowers are also used in the oil market, just like soybeans. So that's one of the things that pushed prices higher. Another one would be inflation. Inputs for farmers are higher. So, you know, that also drags the producer price higher. And then a major one is with the economy recovering, there's a a big demand for food oils and edible oils. So a lot more people are going out to restaurants. A lot more people are eating outside. So this is pushing demand higher and pushing prices higher. And these are mostly external factors. They're not inside the U.S. Although inside the U.S., of course, the demand for edible oils is also picking up. So they had a record crop, but still the demand for oil and, and then, of course, soybean oil is really high inside the US. Uh, with the with the inflation comes something interesting. With the inflation, a lot of households prefer eating protein that is relatively cheaper. So they would switch from beef to something like chicken or pork. And chicken or pork, a very important feed ingredient for chicken and pork is soybean meal. And there's not really a lot of alternatives because soybean meal has very high protein content. If you use sunflower meal or rapeseed meal or something like that, you don't get the same growth in especially in the broiler market so you know with people switching to more eating more chicken and less beef it also increases the demand for soybean meal yeah that makes a lot of sense there was another reason you touched upon in your analysis how does the biodiesel mandate play into soybean prices there are mandates set by the the u.s government that says you know a certain portion of fuel should be from renewable sources so that would be a lot of ethanol coming from the corn or the maize market and then a lot of biodiesel coming from the soybean oil market now uh, currently i think the u.s mandates are for about 21 billion gallons it should come from renewable sources in 2022 so with this being the law uh, Uh, A lot of oil products would go into the the biodiesel market. So soybeans just being the biggest one by far, it's it's a lot bigger than, for example, sunflowers in the US or or any other oil seed. So with this being the biggest one, it's also the obvious choice for, for biodiesel. So a little less than half of all the soybean oil being produced in the U.S. goes into the biofuel market. So, you know, it's quite a big portion of the soybean oil market. And then, of course, the more that goes into biofuel, the less is available for food oil or edible oil. And you said you found this information in the USD March estimate. I'm assuming that this report also had to do with the prices that we see right now. Yeah, so this is one of the reports that gets uh, watched very closely and it, and it comes out monthly. So it's called the World Agricultural Supply and Demand Estimates. So every month the USDA, they release this report, obviously because it's a, a US 
um, entity. It's very U.S. focused. So the the United States have their own section where it's a detailed supply and demand of the U.S. crop, and it's for most commodities from rice, oil seeds, feed grains wheat all the way through so this world agricultural supply and demand estimate comes out monthly and it also gives some of the big producing countries it will also give some details into their crops so for example in the soybean market it will show brazil argentina it will show china which is not a big producer but a very big importer also the european market so it's a monthly report and Many people will have their own estimates, but I think this is the kind of the benchmark because the USDA have a lot of resources they can use. Their estimates are pretty accurate. Market prices usually moves around what's being said in these reports. So they're monthly reports and they're they're watched very closely. I see. So it sounds like he consistently watched report for production estimates. According to your analysis, you then looked into crush margins to understand where prices have risen. What goes into the calculation of a crush margin and what do they indicate? Yeah, of course. Soybeans, when they get harvested, about 95, probably even more than that, of soybeans gets separated into the oil component and the soybean meal component. So it means that Oil gets extracted from soybeans, all right? And then we talked about the demand for these oils from the biodiesel market and also from the edible oil market. But the other product that comes from this is the part that's left over, which is called the soybean meal. So the soybean meal, we also talked about this very important feed ingredient with high protein going into poultry and pork. So this whole process of separating oil from the rest of the soybean is called crushing. So it's crushing the soybeans. So basically it just comes down to separating the oil from the rest of the soybean. And then you get these two products. So you get the oil and you get the meal. Now crush margins, to explain it in a simple way, would be like if I pay for the soybean, right? how much do I pay for the soybean? And then I split it into these two components And then if I sell these two components, um, how much money do I get? If I get more by selling oil and meal than I paid for the proportionate amount of soybeans, that means I have a positive crash margin. The higher the prices of meal and soybean oil compared to the raw soybean, the higher the crushing margin. Now, just looking at the factors that we've laid out right now, a lot of them are external factors pushing the U.S. prices to rise. What do you think would be the case if these factors ease? What would prices look like by Q2 or Q3? Because it's an annual crop, soybeans get planted in the U.S. Usually planting starts from about May and then it gets harvested in October. So let's say the last time the U.S. had their very own fundamentals was when the crop was still on the land. So let's say from after the harvest, we know the total supply in the U.S., and then it, it shifts more to taking a look at the, the demand side. So the demand side is, is what's driving prices and a lot of external factors. But in about two months, the U.S., they're going to start planting their own crop again. So then the, the focus will be back on the supply side from the U.S. Now, it's hard to predict all these factors, the, the external factors, I mean... <laughs> Oil prices worldwide are high. It it pulled back a little bit. We've got the ongoing war in in Ukraine and Russia, which is underpinning prices of basically all oil seeds. We've got strong demand for edible oils coming as the economy recovers, which I think will continue. And then also strong demand for soybean meal, animal feed. So I think that's also going to continue. And then the focus is going to shift more and more to the domestic fundamentals in the US. So they've been plagued by drought for you know more than a year now and there are less than two months to go before they need to start planting. In the Midwest it's dry. Soil moisture is really low. So if you're planting soybeans with low soil moisture, you know, it doesn't get off to a good start. If conditions remain dry over the Midwest, prices will obviously keep finding support. Even 
without the external factors. The weather will play a massive role. If, if the Midwest gets some good precipitation before May and the external factors slow down uh, or the external demand slows down, that could bring prices down. But at the moment, I would say most fundamentals are keeping prices at these high levels of about $16, $17 a bushel. In your second analysis, you extend your perspective to the global sphere. I'm going to ask you the overarching question that guides your analysis. As was the case in the US, world production was pretty high on record. But why are prices still so high? Yeah, of course, uh, world production has increased. And it's even the crop that's getting harvested now in the Southern Hemisphere. And it's counted together with the US crop that was harvested in October. So that would be the 2021-22 season, uh, world season. So this crop is the third highest on record. So it's a big crop, but supply is increasing. World production is increasing, but the world demand is increasing comparatively more. So that's basically what it comes down to. Now, we've talked about all the the uses of soybeans and their byproducts. So the edible oil market, the biodiesel market, the animal feed market for soybean meal. So there are not really a lot of alternatives in terms of soybean meal. All right, so some of these are substitutes. So you you can replace soybean oil with sunflower oil or with palm oil. And then also prices are quite related to crude oil because crude oil gets made into fuel. And then, of course, soybean oil gets made into biodiesel, which is also fuel. So that's related. But on the soybean meal side, because of the high protein content of about 45%, you can't really use anything else unless you're switching to something like bone meal or or bean meal. But there's no other veg or let's say field crop that can give you the same kind of, of protein content. So it's quite a unique product which the world is using. Like people are eating more and more chicken if you look at world trends. So this being a very important feed ingredient, there's not really something else you can use for that. Now, there are a lot of substitutes for soybean oil, but the demand for all kinds of edible oil is just uh, over the last six months or so has just been massive. So we've seen shortages in in palm oil, um, sunflowers, obviously, as the, the Eastern Europe war going um and then you know some of the other options would be something like uh, uh, flaxseed oil or canola oil or rapeseed so soybeans has a very unique market and a very strong foothold in the marketplace so you know it can't really be replaced by anything else so just by virtue of how finite land available for production is on earth it's hard to drastically increase soybean production to meet demand. Is there a precedent perhaps in which production area may have drastically increased or novel technology helped increase soybean production? And uh, then we should probably look at Brazil in this case because they kind of showed the way things happened. And that's why in my analysis, I compared it to 2012 and what we're seeing now. So in 2012, there were also really high prices. And it's also like there needs to be an expansion under the area, under soybeans. So not just the yields, but also the area needed to expand. Now, there were very few countries that were able to expand their area, the exception being Brazil. Brazil, they basically doubled the area under soybeans from 2012. But obviously, there are some repercussions to that. So it's not like the land was just available somewhere. A large part of it was they had to encroach on the rainforest, you know, clear some land to be able to plant soybeans. If we're saying... Look, soybean production is having a hard time keeping up with world demand. Not just yields need to improve, but we also need to find more area under soybeans. The question still remains like where where is this gonna come from? And like the only option it seems would still be in Brazil. I see. So more production has come from Brazil, but Brazil seems to still be the only viable solution for an increase in production. 
That's right. They overtook the the US in 2017. So they overtook the US because they increased the area under soybeans so much. But like I said, with these increases, like it has to come from somewhere. And most of it, unfortunately, has to be in the rainforest in the Amazon basin. So that's the most viable solution to increasing soybean production in the world. But of course, there are many negative effects to this also. Well, I think we're nearing the end of our time together. Are there any last comments you would like to add? Yeah, maybe one part that we didn't talk about. So before um, before soybean prices made a record, about in December, before the crop was planted in South America, actually the crop estimates were pretty high. So for world production, the estimates were about 377 million metric tons. Now, if that was the case, world production would have been more than than world consumption this season. But these estimates were made on expecting high yields, expecting yields to improve every year in in other countries. Now, I mean, that that is kind of realistic, given that we talked about precision farming and the technologies improving, the varieties of soybeans being planted, uh, things like that. So, So definitely yields will improve over the long term but with climate change or there are a lot more years where yields drop far below let's say the baseline or the expectations where they should be you know if climate change gets worse obviously yields won't increase as much as expected that's really interesting so as you said this year might be a signal that prior forecast models based on historical data might be losing their precision because of climate change, or that other factors are playing into production that we might not have been aware of in the past. Well, Theo, I had a great time speaking to you. Thank you so much for your time today. Yeah, thank you so much, Bia. Um, <laughs> it's always interesting to talk about this and uh, yeah, see what uh, what is happening in the world market. So. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave a review, subscribe, and share our podcast. Check out church.com slash intelligence data for more price analyses and up-to-date insights into the food and agricultural industry.